Great. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here um, talking with you today. I see we've got someone who has their hand up. Um, if you've got a question, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll try to address it as we get going. Um, uh, I might not be able to right away, but I'll try to take a couple breaks um, through it, just kind of see what's going on. Um, thanks so much, Dave, for your presentation and providing some really good background on kind of what's going on with uh, forest and tree pests, uh, in particular in that um, pine context, as well as talking about some of the new things that you're struggling with and dealing with. Uh, I am thankful that we don't have uh, Asian longhorn beetle in my part of the woods yet. Um, as well as spotted lanternfly. Uh, no, thank you. Um, we will we will try to not get them for as long as possible, um, which is joking. But of course, I do think that prevention and uh, slowing and stopping the spread of those things is is uh, the best strategy. So you're not trying to play catch up on the other end. Um, so today in this talk, I'm going to be oh, sorry. I'm going to be um, talking about a wide range of different things. So it's going to be a smattering of all sorts of different. Uh, insects and diseases that can impact uh, particularly in hardwood systems. So I'm going to talk about gypsy moth, emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, laurel wilt, a whole range of common foliar issues, um, including yellow poplar weevil and anthracnose. And then I'm going to mention oak decline and some associated issues with that. Um, can everyone see my slides okay and see me? Um, if you ever if you have problems seeing those or hearing me, just let me know. Um, so so first, I want to talk about gypsy moth, uh, and in particular, European gypsy moth. Um, there is an Asian gypsy moth. Both of these are invasive issues in the U.S., but the Asian gypsy moth tends to be uh, on the West Coast for now, and let's hope it stays there. Um, and the European gypsy moth is um, here with us in the Eastern United States. Although I say here with us, um, it's been here for quite some time, uh, and it's been moving extremely slowly, which is a great thing. Um, uh, Dave mentioned in his talk, you know, the difference between emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle in terms of, you know, how their biology affects how they can be managed. You know, we couldn't control emerald ash borer because of the way it moves, where we can Asian longhorn beetle um, better because it's not going to move as fast. Gypsy moth is kind of even further on that um, spectrum in that the females are flightless. So here's the, the female adult gypsy moths, European gypsy moth, and they don't actually fly. They have these wings, but they're not gonna move around much. Um, the males will, and they'll fly around and look for females. Um, but unless we move it, it's gonna move extremely slowly because these females aren't flying. Um, but they do gather gregariously and lay their eggs and produce tons and tons and tons of these caterpillars. Um, so this is the, the problem right here is the caterpillar phase. Um, so they are just eating the leaves and we have many different native caterpillars that can, you know, gather in these large numbers, tank caterpillars that will also defoliate trees. Um, but the problem with European gypsum moth is that it does it year after year after year. So it has um, kind of boom years back to back to back uh, that really can stress trees out because a tree can deal with a year of defoliation. And um, in this case, gypsy moth happening a little earlier in the season might put out another flush of leaves. Um, and then the next year, maybe it's a little stress, but it'll recover. But year after year of that can really stress trees out over time. So kind of to give you an example of that, here are some photos of, you know, the gypsy moth feeding and just completely defoliating these trees. And then trees that are completely, you know, it looks like it's still winter. Um, and if you've ever been anywhere during one of these um, uh, caterpillar outbreaks, including our natives, it's quite, uh, you know, quite kind of surreal to be out in the woods and have all of the leaves off of the trees. Um, but uh, the problem again with gypsy moth is that it's doing it year after year after year. So um, gypsy moth has been here for a while and you've probably heard people talk about it before. Um, and it, I think that can lead to some complacency in terms of it must not be a big problem because it's been here since the 1800s and you know it hasn't reached me yet, at least for a lot of kind of the, the area 
um, in, in my state, Kentucky and others, um, you know, gypsy moth will feed on a wide range of, of plants, but it especially likes oaks and it is most damaging to oaks and forests where it comes in. Um, and so if you think about, you know, potential area that it could impact, there's a lot of risk area that has not been uh, affected yet. So this is a map of kind of where it currently is and all the colors um, have gypsy moth established in them and also are under quarantine. Uh, so, so the big question is kind of um, why is it moving so slow? So part of it is the biology of this insect, but part of it, and I want to give a big shout out to this program, um, and also kind of another example to go along with those that Dr. Coyle mentioned of how management can have a big impact is the Slow the Spread program. So this is a partnership between federal and state um, organizations to slow the spread of gypsy moth. So the idea is that there's areas where gypsy moth is established, and we're not really going to do a whole lot about that, um, these dark blue areas. Um, but what you can really do is you can try to slow its spread in those kind of peripheral areas to uh, the natural speed. So if humans are moving it around to stop that, um, and just let it move little by little. Why is that important? I think some people might ask, well, if we're all going to get it, what's the point in trying to slow it down? Um, the slower and the longer it takes to get to places, uh, the more tools we're going to have in our toolbox to deal with it, um, as well as the longer it's here, the more of its own pathogens and parasites it's going to acquire and accumulate that hopefully long term will be part of the solution for keeping it in check. So the slow the spread program involves a, a wide range of different strategies, um, especially right along this border um, from pheromones to insecticides to try to really slow it from spreading. Um, a lot of that's done with kind of, uh, again, trying to trap individuals to see where are they. And if uh, new infestations are discovered beyond where they should be, eradicating those. So if you ever see these boxes in trees, if you've ever noticed these triangular boxes, um, you can uh, be happy that they are looking for gypsy moth and trying to slow the spread, trying to prevent it from being a problem in new areas. Um, so they have found that after those um, gypsy moths come in, uh, the quality of oak and the quality of um, oak forests really decreases. So I'd really like to stop that from happening as long as possible in our area. Um, and the longer we have, probably the, the less bad it's going to be when it finally does arrive. So next when we see these little traps, you can kind of be happy about them like I am and think, oh, those are my tax dollars at work doing something good. Um, and they found that, you know, for every dollar spent on this slow the spread program, it saves about $4 in regulatory costs alone, which, which I'm always excited about. And, um, you know, just to kind of give you a little bit more feel for why this is a good program, um, uh, this is kind of a projection of the impact that this program has had in just slowing the natural spread of, of gypsy moth. Um, this is kind of where we're projected to be uh, without this program right now. Um, but you can see this is where we are, and, and we're projected to stay right around here for the next 20 years, um, I think in large part due to this program and due to that concerted effort of people not moving contaminated um, material, not moving those eggs around um, unintentionally that could cause new outbreaks. So. I put this one in here to start because gypsy moth is, um, you know, it's been around forever. We've all heard of it, uh, but it's still a problem and it's still a risk to us. And I think um, programs like this are really beneficial, but it's also an example of, you know, the future is not entirely bleak when it comes to forest health. When we talk about insects and diseases that impact trees, a lot of times it's doom and gloom and it's all of these things are coming and killing your trees. Uh, but I think that there's a lot that we can do. And I think that um, the diversity, especially in our hardwood forests, is an excellent buffer to some of these issues. And that's true with the next organism I'm going to talk about, emerald ash borer. So depending on where you're located, emerald ash borer is old news, and you're probably tired of hearing about it, and it's already killed your, all your ash trees. But in other areas, it's just starting to arrive. So I do want to kind of mention uh, what it is and what it does, um, as well as kind of what do we do on the tail end of emerald ash borer. So emerald ash borer is an invasive beetle. Here you can see it, um, you know, with its wings spread out, uh, looking very beautiful. That's probably not what you're going to see. 
And you're also probably not going to see the larvae that are actually causing the damage. So the beetles lay their eggs um, on trees and those larvae when they hatch will burrow into the tree and they'll do extensively tunnel um, pretty much just under the bark uh, in that vascular system of the tree. And it really doesn't damage the wood uh, in the same way that the Asian longhorn beetle that um, Dave shows does, but it does extensive damage in that vascular system, which is really what the tree needs um, to move around water and resources and survive. So what you're probably gonna notice are dead trees um, because this is happening under the bark and these beetles really, it's a, it's a brief window of time that they're out. Um, so you might notice the dead trees. I think most people first notice some dead branches, maybe some flagging, thinning canopies in the landscape setting. Um, uh, and, and if things are a little bit further along, you might see some D-shaped exit holes in the bark, uh, or you might see bark flaking off with this really squiggly serpentine tunnels underneath and this kind of um, increased woodpecker activity with bark flaking off everywhere and, and big holes as, as other things come in and try to eat those larvae that are in the tree. And woodpeckers are actually quite good predators of emerald ash borer larvae, not good enough to control the populations, but um, you can see the, the impact that they have if you walk around uh, in an impacted area. Um, so, so this is what I think most people notice, but by the time you start to notice things like this um, or cracks in, in the branches, um, that emerald ash borer, those larvae have been in there for a while. They've been tunneling, they've been causing damage to that tree. Um, so, uh, you know, there's typically, as with many things, a lag time between people notice the problems and uh, when that insect first arrived and started damaging those trees. So where is the emerald ash borer now? I guess the short answer is it's all over. <laughs> it is all over um, the eastern U.S. Um, these, this insect was initially from Asia, um, so you know they have uh, ash there as well, um, but it here in North America it impacts all of our ash species as well as white fringe tree, um, and you know, but the, the, the susceptibility of those trees might vary just a little bit, or I guess their tolerance to that insect. So if you're here in the bluegrass area of Kentucky, you might still see some blue ash around. Blue ash uh, can tolerate um, infestation better. It can defend itself a little bit better. It's less attractive as a host, but green and white ash, which are our dominant species, have been decimated by it. Um, pretty much complete uh, mortality of green and white ash uh, wherever it's found. Um, and so if, if you're like most of this area where emerald ash borer has been there a little bit, um, you know, you're thinking, okay, this, this beetle is coming and it's killing my trees. So now what? Or maybe it's already come and it's already killed my trees. So now what? Um, so with ash, uh, you know, there are very important considerations in both the uh, landscape and woodlands, because ash is such an important tree in a lot of um, uh, urban areas, in a lot of communities, as a yard tree, as a street tree. Um, I think what happened was when um, prior to ash, elms, elms were the street trees. And so streets were lined with elm. And of course, Dutch elm disease, which is a, an invasive pathogen, came in and wiped out elm. Now we still have some elm around um, in the woods because there's a little bit more resistance to that pathogen with elm than there is with ash, um, so maybe about 10%. Um, and so elm's still around, but really it was eliminated from these urban settings. Uh, so, so elm's down, so what did we do? We planted those areas with ash, which worked great for a while um, until the emerald ash borer came in and killed all those trees. Uh, so I think kind of embedded in there is a story about diversity and the ability of diversity to buffer us from these things in the future, because there is going to be something in the future that impacts another species, um, whether it's Asian longhorn beetle or maples or you know, something we don't even know about yet. Uh, so what I see now in our area, and it probably differs, you know, in each different area, um, is that these streets that were lined with elm and then were lined with ash are now lined with red maple. Um, and so we just heard about Asian longhorn beetle. It could come in and take out that red maple. Um, so thinking about diversity as, as a tool 
for buffering long term. Um, and in your ones, things are going to be a little bit different too. And I'll talk about some of the considerations with that. But in both of these scenarios, it's really about laying the foundation for success post emerald ash borer. Um, there are some treatments, and I'll talk about those. Um, but especially in your woodlands, uh, that's really not going to be viable for most, most folks. Um, that's, it costs money, it needs to be repeated on a regular basis. Um, so thinking about how do you transition from ash to some other things that are going to meet your objectives um, or those of the landowner you're working with. So for insecticide treatments, um, just a few notes that this is really only for healthy trees. Um, and, and trees that are, are worth your while to maintain because it does cost money and needs to be repeated indefinitely into the future. So, um, you know, that's going to require some thought on your end in terms of whether it merits that insecticide treatment um, or if we'd be better off to kind of uh, plant something else and uh, invest in that instead. Um, but there are some fantastic resources for this. And in particular, I want to point you towards this one. And I'll try to put the link to this in the chat when we're done. Um, Insecticide Options for Protecting Ash Trees from Emerald Ash Borer, a really great publication. Um, and it goes through a lot of different um, possibilities and scenarios for different insecticide options that I highly recommend checking out and looking over. Um, but just to kind of emphasize a few key points, um, this is really going to be an option for those healthy trees. So if the tree is a full canopy or kind of more than half a canopy, it hasn't been too damaged by the emerald ash borer yet. Um, or something else, maybe, you know, it's just not a great tree to save for other reasons, if I'm in the wrong spot, or it's already got some damage, um, you know, they're not going to be good candidates for, for insecticide treatment, because this is a systemic insecticide, so something that needs to be taken up by the vascular system. Um, so if the tree is already really compromised and that vascular system has already been hammered by the emerald ash borer, um, it's not really going to be effectively um, transported throughout the tree as well as you're investing time and money into something that might be better spent um, if that tree is already really damaged or is not you know, the best tree to begin with. Uh, so there are many different formulations and products on the market in terms of insecticides. And this is that publication that I was mentioning earlier, just kind of one of their figures. And one of the reasons why I like it is that they'll go through you know, products that are on the market, active ingredient, how it's applied, when it's applied in a really condensed form that I think is really useful. And obviously always follow the label, um, but uh, it gives you kind of some basics there. So uh, there are many different products on the market. One thing I would say is that for professionals and professional application, Imamectin Benzoate has consistently provided highly effective EAB control. Um, now, there are different products that would be applied by individuals versus those professionals, both in terms of the ingredients themselves, but also how they're applied. Um, so, you know, that's that's something to consider. But um, this uh, imamectin benzoate products would be still effective for larger trees, and you can have more time between treatments. So you only have to treat maybe once every two years or three years, depending on where you're located. Um, and, and there is some evidence that um, after the emerald ash borer has been there a while, you know, when it first arrives, there's this huge boom of beetles, right? That's a big population. But those populations decrease over time. Um, so not to say that you won't have to keep treating your trees. That seems like it's going to need to happen for the foreseeable future. But you might be able to get more time from each of those treatments. So instead of two years, three years, or maybe eventually four, as those beetle populations decrease. Now, what I'm seeing in my area, and probably what many of you see in your areas, is um, those large mature trees were killed by the emerald ash borer. And now there's infinite ash regen. So lots and lots of seedlings and saplings coming up um, from that seed bank that was there. Uh, and, um, you know, once those get, it doesn't take too large, but once those get big enough, that will be kind of another uh, major food source for emerald ash borer to, to perpetuate that. Um, so another kind of resource that I recommend you check out if this is something that's new to your area or you're just starting to think about is the cost calculator for emerald ash borer from Purdue University. Um, I'll also try to put that in the chat, but it kind of um, is a calculator that you can work through some simplified cost calculations in terms of removing trees or treating trees, um, what that might look like over time, because I think especially in the landscape setting, 
a lot of people uh, assume that the cost of treating trees is going to be too much and that they might as well let that tree die um, and plant something else instead. But uh, the removal costs of those large trees can be huge. Um, not to mention the fact that yes, you'll eventually have a large tree, but the ecosystem, if you have a large ash tree, the services that, that tree were providing in that, um, especially in urban landscapes, um, will not be met any time in the near future. Uh, so, you know, those costs might, might vary a little bit. So uh, another thing that I'd recommend for those, especially, and this is true in urban or woodland settings, but in the woodland setting, uh, thinking about, you know, how much ash was there to begin with. So this is my state, Kentucky, and this is a map of ash distribution on the front end, which you should be able to get for any of your areas. Um, it, but it tells me that across the state, ash is only about 4% of the trees. So if you lose 4% of the trees in your woods, I mean, it depends on what else you have, it depends on what else is going on, but it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and sometimes it is though, because those were your 4% most valuable trees. Um, but if you're in one of these areas that actually had a lot of ash, maybe more like uh, 25, 30, 35% ash, this is a big deal. So your management approach to it is gonna vary depending on where you're located. And of course, there's a great variation in different properties. So knowing what's there, knowing what you've got and what's at risk, because if you have uh, white or green ash or any other ash, um, it's going to be killed by the emerald ash borer in the near future. Uh, so starting to think about that on the front end. Um, so in addition to kind of how much ash you have, how far along is the damage by emerald ash borer? Um, here's a picture of some firewood. And you can see that here's the, the emerald ash borer's tunnels uh, through that. And it's just, just on that outer, outer um, section. So people will still use that wood for firewood. Um, but uh, the emerald ash borer doesn't impact the wood. But the second those trees start to go downhill, they become a banquet for all sorts of other insects and diseases. Um, so you might not notice it, and the wood might look perfectly fine to you. But if you were to look up close at some of those trees, the wood from those trees that have been killed by the emerald ash borer, uh, what you might find is really shortly after, um, they also are impacted by all sorts of other insects. So these are ambrosia beetles, tiny, tiny little ambrosia beetle holes that have riddled um, this wood. They bring them with them a fungus that stains the wood. Um, there are lots of decay fungi out there that really rapidly compromise the quality of that wood. Um, so I did a survey of loggers in our state to see you know, uh, what kind of value were they getting for ash that was killed by emerald ash borer? Because emerald ash borer doesn't kill the wood, but uh, they reported that within just a few months of being killed by uh, the emerald ash borer, uh, the value of that wood was less than a third of what it would have been otherwise because of all of these secondary issues. Um, so something to keep in mind uh, for a couple of different reasons. So first, you know, if you've got emerald ash borer moving in and you've got high value ash in your woods and you're already kind of thinking about harvesting, consider a harvest before the emerald ash borer kills those trees. Um, because we used to tell people, oh, you've got a little bit of time, the, the wood isn't impacted. But now seeing how many secondary issues come in, you really want to consider that on the front end. And of course, that totally depends. It depends on your situation. It depends on um, you know, the market situation for ash, uh, which is varying. So um, something to think about you know, that could give you some funding to offset management practices that would set your woodland up for success post emerald ash borer. You're going to lose those trees anyways. Um, and you know, that's not for everyone, but just, just something to think about uh, as, as a tool to help you get where you want to be. Um, in addition, something I really recommend everyone think about, regardless of what your management objective is, uh, if you've got the emerald ash borer moving into your area, watch for invasive plants before it gets there, remove them before it gets there. Um, because what we see in our area a lot, and I'm sure others will echo this, is that if there was an invasive in your understory before the emerald ash borer came in, um, uh, you know, and that canopy gets opened up and you've got more light coming in, what you want to see and what our naturally regenerating hardwood forest should do is that the um, saplings that were in the understory are going to take advantage of that. They're going to say, now's my time to shine and grow up through those canopy gaps, right? That's assuming you've got a, a, a nice uh, level of region in there to start with. 
Um, but instead, what I see a lot of are just invasive plants dominating the understory. And you'll hear more about invasive plants from Chris Evans shortly. Um, but in my area, the ones, the two in particular that have really benefited from emerald ash borer are this one in this picture, winter creeper, which is an evergreen vine that just carpets the forest floor, grows up trees and can weigh them down, but mostly just forms this dense mat that nothing's going to grow through and you're not going to get the regen you want to see. You're not going to get the diversity of native plants that you want because you've got to see a winter creeper as well as bush honeysuckle, which also, you know, it's a shrub, but it kind of does the same thing in that it'll grow in a really dense layer and prevent what you want to be seeing happening in your woods, that natural regeneration, uh, that ability of those woodlands to recover from a disturbance like emerald ash borer. But this is true for any disturbance, whether it's um, emerald ash borer or a harvest or an ice storm or whatever. If you've got invasives in there on the front end, if you manage those um, early, you can save yourself a lot of work rather than trying to play catch up down the road, which is unfortunately a lot of what we're doing in this area. Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention is that, okay, all of those secondary issues and um, kind of problems that are arising with uh, the quality of the wood once the emerald ash borer kills those trees. So um, once the trees are killed by emerald ash borer, they become extremely hazardous and susceptible to failure, dropping branches. Um, so not only kind of from, from both kind of your safety perspective, and this is very true in the urban environment too, uh, you want to be careful of those trees and you want to, if it's near a potential target, um, if it could fall on something, if it hurts someone or some property, you want to remove those before they start falling apart, um, not after because then it can be quite dangerous. Or if you've got, um, you know, a woodland that has a lot of them, being aware of that is if you're hiking around during high wind conditions, extremely hazardous. Those trees um, will snap. They have this distinctive kind of snapping uh, midway up um, uh, habit, um, but they'll also drop branches, um, be a major issue. So if you're considering logging, do this before your trees start falling apart. Not only will you get more money for them, um, and I see we got a comment in the chat from Chris that that ash prices are looking good in his neck of the woods. Um, so, so, you know, that's a good option for some folks. Um, so do that before your trees start falling apart because you'll get more money for them and it's also less risky. Um, after they're going to be low value, those trees are going to fall apart rapidly. Not to say that those snags don't have value for wildlife. They certainly do. And if these trees are in an area where if they fall, no big deal, uh, then you can leave them. But if you're spending time in there, be wary of them, especially when it's windy. And this is the point when I always really encourage woodland owners to call a forester, call a professional, work with them. If you've got a wood that's full of ash that's falling apart, um, just talk about what your options are because they can be very dangerous. So as with other invasives and other insects and diseases that I'll talk about, you know, emerald ash borer is bad, um, but there's a lot that you can do to set the stage for a bright future, um, especially with regard to um, uh, something that's only impacting, you know, a small percentage of your trees. What you really want to do is kind of enable your woods to recover themselves and to help them along in that process. Uh, so transition to some other species that are going to be valuable for whatever those objectives are. So the next thing I want to briefly touch on is the hemlock woolly adelgid, another invasive issue from Asia that has arrived um, here and been here for quite some time, so since the 50s, uh, but killing our hemlock trees. Now, why is that significant? Hemlocks are extremely important for those um, ecosystems where they occur. If you think about the places you typically find hemlocks, you're talking about these riparian areas, um, very important for water quality, very important for amphibians and other sensitive uh, uh, animals. And um, the hemlock is being killed by the hemlock woolly adelgid. And now, of course, people will also plant hemlock in their landscape settings, and we can talk some about the different considerations in those too. Um, but in this photo, you can see a bunch of dead hemlock trees, which unfortunately is a pretty common sight these days, um, as the hemlock woolly adelgid uh, is established longer and longer. Um, but these, these adelgids are, are very tiny insects. Um, they're, they're kind of 
so small that they're hard to see, but I'll show you a few photos of those. And they feed at the base of the hemlock needles and they suck the sap and the nutrients and they cause the needles to die. They'll cause those shoots to die and prevent new growth. Um, so it's not like the um, other insects that we've talked about um, in terms of tunneling in the wood and cutting off the vascular system, or I talked about European gypsy moth you know, eating all of the leaves and stressing the tree that way. Um, although it's a little similar to that in that it's going to suck all the, the, the sap from the needles and kill those tips. Um, so it's not going to kill the tree right away. It's going to take several years. So little by little, the tree gets more and more stressed, um, uh, more and more susceptible to other issues as well. And trees that are already stressed are going to succumb even faster. Uh, so um, a little bit of background on that. So here's some close-ups of it. So the life cycle of these woolly adelgids is really complex. Um, but in general, they've got two generations a year on hemlock. Um, and what you're seeing here, and you're not gonna see these. So this is like a real close up with the adult um, adelgid and the eggs that it's laying. Um, but what you're going to notice are these cottony white egg sacs that it produces. Um, and it, they're not always visible. Um, they're not gonna be visible all times of year. It kind of depends on where things are in its life cycle. Um, but they're the easiest way to spot it because otherwise you're trying to find this like tiny little adult that's like crawling around. No, um, this, is, this is what most people are gonna see and look for. Um, uh, in my area, kind of more, more obvious in the, the early spring, um, but this is the, the, the kind of telltale sign of the woolly adelgia. So where is it right now? Um, everything that is a color on this map and uh, is kind of where hemlock occurs. Um, and you can see the bulk of it is here kind of in our area in the central Appalachians or southern Appalachians. We have um, eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock. Both of them are um, killed by hemlock woolly adelgids. So you can see most of the range of uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid is there. There are some pockets in this western part of the range, um, but uh, really it's throughout, but it's sporadic. So it's not a consistent kind of blanket of hemlock woolly adelgid, or even if you think of emerald ash borer moving in, it's kind of coming in this wave. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid is a little bit patchier. Think about where those hemlocks occur. It's not a consistent band of hemlocks across the landscape, right? So you can get isolated areas that either have it or don't that are relatively close to each other. And there's gonna be kind of more nuance there to some of the patterns. I know that in terms of our area, when we had that polar vortex a few years ago and conditions were really cold for a prolonged period of time, it seemed like populations were kind of knocked back a little bit, at least in some areas. Um, but obviously that's not gonna be a long-term uh, thing that's gonna prevent it from being a problem or killing trees. So. There are some treatment options uh, uh, for hemlock willy adelgid. There are concept insecticides, kind of horticultural oils that might be possible in some um, scenarios. But for the most part, what we're talking about are systemic insecticides. And there are a couple different types that have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I'd say in the uh, forest setting, those with imidacloprid are the most commonly used. Uh, because of a few different things. First, it is cheaper. Um, it lasts longer. Uh, so both of those things are really valuable when you're not necessarily going to be visiting a tree that much. Um, so the imidacloprid treatments might last for several years versus the dinotefrin ones that would just be a couple years. Um, so uh, with that, here's a picture of someone doing a soil drench. Um, this is uh, Elizabeth McCarty. University of Georgia. And, uh, you know, there are different ways to apply insecticide treatments to trees. And it depends. It depends on the tree. It depends on where it's located. You know, how close is it to a waterway? Um, but there's, um, you know, soil drenches, there's soil injections, trunk injections, um, there's base, uh, bark spray, and there are even um, little kind of tablets that you can bury in the, the soil nearby. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll try to put this link in the chat as well. Um, Elizabeth McCarty's group has some great publications about kind of optimizing dosage and different options for hemlock woolly adelgid control. Um, so highly recommend those. 
um, other management options, there is a lot of work being done to look at biological controls and predatory beetles, um, Laracobius beetles that can actually uh, attack those, those adelgids. Um, a lot of this is still kind of in early phases, but hopefully long term, that will be part of the solution for keeping those um, woolly adelgids in check. Um, there are also silvicultural techniques that can be done. And in particular, if you're thinking about how do you combine the biological control with these insecticide treatments, because obviously the insecticide treatments are going to impact those predatory beetles as well. Um, there's some great new resources for integrating the chemical and biological control strategies for hemlock willy adelgid. And um, if that's something that you're looking at or dealing with, I strongly recommend you check those out. And I'll try to put that link in the chat. There's a new resource manager's guide um, kind of helping you plan through some of that and how might you set up that strategy um, that the Forest Service recently came out with that I recommend checking out. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move on to a new, like we needed a new one, a new invasive uh, issue in our area. And that is laurel wilt disease. And I say of sassafras here, but that's of sassafras in my neck of the woods. If you're in this whole area, it's gonna be of red bay or of other species in the Loraceae, the broad group that contains red bay, it contains sassafras, it contains spice bush, it contains um, avocado, it contains other species. But in this area, mostly what it's gonna be impacting is um, sassafras and spice bush. So it just depends, it depends on where you are. One thing that I always get questions about um, is that we've got a lot of species that are commonly called laurels that are not actually in the laurel family. So in my area, I get calls about, is this, is mountain laurel gonna be killed? Um, no, no, it's not because it's not actually in that family despite the name. Um, so that might be true where you are as well. Uh, so it's the, the Loraceae, um, those uh, plants are gonna be killed by laurel wilt. Um, and what this is, is that it's a complex. So it's a fungus that is being carried from tree to tree by a tiny little ambrosia beetle. We know ambrosia beetles, you're probably very well familiar with them. Um, there are many, many species of ambrosia beetles, both native and non-native. And um, in general, when I think of ambrosia beetles, I think of stress trees. So when I see ambrosia beetle damage, I think that tree was stressed and that ambrosia beetle was a nail in the coffin for whatever was going wrong with that tree. Um, but in this case, uh, this is an invasive ambrosia beetle that's native to Asia, an invasive fungus that is, um, you know, coming with it and is attracted to healthy trees as well. And um, most of the time, these ambrosia beetles, the fungus they bring with them doesn't really cause much disease on the tree. They're fungus farmers and they're bringing those fungi with them to eat, but it's not going to hurt the tree um, typically. But in this case, that fungus gets in the tree and uh, will rapidly kill that tree and um, move systemically in the vascular system. So that's really different from some other things because just one introduction of that fungus is all that's needed to kill that tree. Um, it doesn't have to be a high beetle population to cause death of trees, but that beetle is kind of what's spreading it from tree to tree. Now, some of these species also um, have roots that are connected and will grow clonally. That's very common in sassafras. And so that fungus can also spread through those um, to kill trees uh, as well. So um, both of these are invasive and from Asia. So to give you some, some pointers for what it looks like um, on sassafras, uh, or on spice bush or, you know, in other species. Uh, one of the first things that I see is um, early fall leaf color, whatever that fall leaf color looks like. So in sassafras, it's this gorgeous red color. Um, in spice bush, it's a yellow color, uh, but wilty leaves and fall leaf color. And what that's telling you is that you have the flow of water in that tree has been cut off. So these are effectively symptoms of wilt, of water stress um, from that. Uh, but also just a lot of kind of dead, dead um, uh, branches, dead trees. Um, these beetles are most attracted to the large trees. So 
I know that most folks think of sassafras as being like tiny little trees and fence rows, um, but we have some huge sassafras as well. And I've seen very, very large trees killed um, by laurel wilt. Um, so the beetles are most attracted to the larger trees, but then they will happily move on to the smaller stuff, at least in my observations. Um, so, you know, this is kind of what, what would catch my eye if I'm driving around and see it. And then if you cut into the bark, um, past the bark into the wood of a tree that has those symptoms. To me, though, the real, the real defining feature is this streaky black staining just under the bark. Um, and this is a, a larger uh, tree where you can kind of see that very clearly. It's not always that clear. Obviously, I cherry picked a sample where you can see it very well, but that's going to be the fungus in the tree as well as the tree's defensive response to that fungus causing that streaky black staining. Other ambrosia beetle associated fungi can cause some staining as well, but I haven't seen anything this black and streaky um, in sassafras. Although now that I'm looking, I've seen plenty of different types of staining. Um, and then this is kind of a smaller twig. I did a, a cut here and you can see just, just under the bark, this dark black um, streaky staining. And sometimes I'll see that staining in at least a couple kind of couple years um, growth. So uh, you might also, if you're very observant, notice these tiny, tiny little holes that are caused by the red bay ambrosia beetles, or maybe the toothpicks that they leave. Um, but most of the time, unless you're an entomologist or have an eagle eye, uh, you're going to miss those because they're so small, um, but you probably won't miss the big dead branches and leaves. <laughs> so uh, one more issue, and, and with laurel wilt, we talked about management. Again, I think for us right now, it's really about not moving contaminated material. Don't move firewood, discourage people from moving firewood, because we don't have a lot of good management options. Um, I know some folks have tried uh, chipping and maybe with mixed success on like does uh, taking down and chipping trees decrease the spread of the ambrosia beetles or it, maybe it does but does it do it fast enough that you can slow down um, that that uh, kind of movement that infestation I don't know it hasn't really been um, very well supported although it's certainly something to do and I doubt it's going to harm anything. Um, we are looking for uh, resistant trees that might have some natural resistance, both with sassafras and red bay. Um, and, uh, you know, there is some work being done looking at fungicide treatments to protect individual trees um, might be worthwhile, especially for those high value landscape trees and others. But I think a lot of that's still kind of in its infancy. Um, so some more to come soon. So I want to wrap this up by talking about some of the common leaf issues, um, just mentioning them because I'm sure you see them and are wondering what they're doing and are they impacting things. So one of the things about these leaf issues is that it can look terrible. So this is a, a photo that one of my colleagues received, a call that's like, all of my trees are dying. Uh, they're dying suddenly, what's happening? Um, which is obviously a concerning call to get. Um, so you go and you look at those trees and yeah, all the canopies look brown, um, but if you look up closely at them, what's actually happening there is um, skeletonizing of these leaves. And we've got a little uh, a skeletonizer, a little larva there that's doing that. Um, and I point this out because with these foliar issues, sometimes they can look awful. <laughs> they can be really uh, uh, striking. And this is the shingle oak skeletonizer, but there's lots of them. Um, and uh, what's really important on our end is to try to distinguish which one of these are just kind of things that look really bad, but are going to resolve and not substantially hurt those trees versus which one of these are things that have the potential to hurt healthy trees. Um, even even uh, if, if this tree is hammered for a year by this skeletonizer, it's probably going to recover just fine next year and not be a big deal. And so there are many others. This past year, I noticed a lot of oak shot hole leaf miner damage, um, which impacts those trees as a leaf miner. So it's eating the tree early, early in their development, right as they're expanding. And so you can get these holes, but you can also get weird distorted growth. Um, and it's very striking. Um, yellow poplar weevil pops up every year, but some years are worse than others, which is another thing with a lot of these um, native insects and diseases that you'll get boom years or maybe several boom years, but then it kind of subsides. So um, yellow poplar weevil has a couple generations and the damage each year kind of depends on what's going on with each of those. 
So uh, we'll definitely see this and it will turn our yellow poplars um, brown. But yellow poplar is one of those trees that if, it, if anything happens, if someone sneezes, it drops all of its leaves and then it'll put them all back on. I don't know if you've noticed this with our recent droughts, but the yellow poplar tree in my backyard dropped its leaves three or four times um, two summers ago and put them back on. Does that stress the tree? Certainly. Um, is that enough to harm the tree in the long term? Uh, if that were happening year after year after year, sure. But if this is just happening, you know, every few years you'll get a major outbreak, um, probably unlikely to do so. Um, anthracnose, there are lots and lots of different anthracnoses out there. Um, they're different species, they impact different species of trees, but many of our tree species can be impacted by anthracnose. It's caused by a fungus and it creates um, these dead patches on trees, this necrosis. Um, it can also do that on shoots. So when it's when it's on the leaves, it's typically not a big problem. Again, those leaves can the trees can just drop those leaves and put out another flush, which costs energy for them, um, and it's a loss of photosynthetic capa capacity, but is not really likely to hurt the trees long term. But once it moves into the shoots, um, as some of them can, or they can in some cases, um, that can impact trees more because then you're talking about the loss of potential new growth and uh, impacting that tree at a different level. Um, so weather conditions are key with anthracnose and they can drive anthracnose. Um, uh, you can get boom years if the weather is conducive to it, uh, those cool wet springs. Um, and on some hosts, it's worse. So I just showed sycamore, which can be, a, a, it can be very impacted by anthracnose. And I am seeing more and more um, sycamore that to me seems like it's been killed by anthracnose, as well as dogwood is another one. And I will say on dogwood, there are multiple different types of anthracnose that can impact dogwood. Uh, there's spot anthracnose that can just create some little issues. Um, there's anthracnose that can move into the shoots and cause death of entire trees. Um, so something to be on the lookout for, again, most of the time when I think of anthracnose, I think of minor foliar issues that will look terrible and then resolve themselves. Um, so before I wrap up, I just want to mention oak decline because I have been seeing a lot more of it on the landscape and I think we're going to continue to see a lot more of it. Uh, because we've had different events that are stressing trees out and that many of our areas our forests are reaching this point where some of the species, say the black oak, are kind of at the upper end of their life expectancy anyways. So there's going to be a lot of opportunistic issues that could take them out. So when people talk about oak decline, what they're talking about typically is stress over time leading to decline and death. Not one particular thing, but a many different factors adding up. Um, in general, red oaks are the most susceptible in part because um, if you think of something like black oak, it is much shorter lived than some other oak species that would have several hundred years. Um, but site also plays a role in this. So just in decline in general, decline in general, imagine water spiraling down a drain and it's spiraling down a drain and it's going going downhill but this is kind of the decline spiral so you've got predisposing factors that are setting the stage things like uh, poor site characteristics tree condition maybe age species health and that are kind of the stage is set for for decline and then you might have an inciting factor some trigger that causes these trees that were already kind of uh, iffy to be stressed, more stressed than they were otherwise. Things like drought, which we've had plenty of, defoliating insects or injury or something like that. And then you've got the contributing factors, all of the nails in the coffin that can act on those stressed trees. Maybe a healthy tree could defend themselves, but a stressed tree, um, they can move in, they can start causing damage, insects and diseases typically. And then you've got this decline over time and it kind of continues, spirals down with all of these contributing factors to eventual tree death. And, um, you know, we certainly have had plenty of drought. And if you're in an area that has gypsy moth, you've had major defoliation events. Um, these are the woods kind of near me uh, two summers ago when we had that major drought in the fall. Um, you can see it looks like fall, but it is it is not. These the sh trees should not be turning color early. This was the drought. Um, so commonly associated with oak decline are various root rots. And I include this picture because you can't really see the roots, but you can see the canopy thinning. And occasionally you might see mushrooms fruiting out of the base. 
um, with oak decline, you might see that rot express in different ways, such as the trees falling over or uh, wind throw or um, tree failure at that root line if it's got kind of major root rot issues. Um, and then, of course, uh, what formerly known as hypoxylin canker, um, biscognioxia canker, um, it very commonly associated with oak decline. But this I see on stressed oaks anywhere. So this is something, again, one of those nails in the coffin that's, um, if you see it, it tells you that that tree is stressed. Um, this, the fungus that causes this moves into trees early in their lives before they're, they're stressed and just kind of waits around for the right conditions for the water pressure to drop. And then it will become active and start causing damage. Um, and you can see these, these kind of mat-like fruiting structures that are going to be either gray or black, depending. Um, so you might have previously caused, called this hypoxylin canker, and I'm not going to hold it against you if you keep calling it that, because this is a mouthful, right? <laughs> so there are other things that are associated with this, like two-line chestnut borer. Um, but in general, I just kind of wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the um, common insects and diseases in our hardwood settings. And, uh, you know, we didn't have time to go into any kind of depth today on that.